Welcome to The Skin Reel, your guide to all things skincare, skin health, beauty, and more, curated by dermatologists and true skin experts. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Alice Mina. I'm a double board certified dermatologist and dermatologic surgeon with over a decade of clinical experience. If you're looking for real, practical, unhyped skincare guidance and expertise, or you just think the skin is really cool, then you're in the right spot. I'm so glad you've tuned in to The Skin Reel. Now let's dive in because this is how dermatologists talk skin. Hi everyone, quick disclaimer here before we start. This podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. If you're looking for help on your skin journey, please check out the American Academy of Dermatology's website, aad.org, where you can search their database for dermatologists near you. It is so important that you have someone in your corner who's well-trained, licensed, and board-certified who can help you make decisions when it comes to your skin health. Okay, got it? Great. Now for the fun stuff. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me on this week's episode of The Skin Reel. This week, I am going to be discussing our skin barrier, what it is, why it's important, and what we can do to protect it. My guest today is Dr. Jack Arbizer, who is bringing with him decades of experience, not only as a clinical dermatologist, but also a physician scientist studying our skin barrier and how it works and helping to develop novel therapies to take care of our skin. Dr. Arbizer has a bachelor's and master's in organic chemistry from Emory. He then received his medical degree and PhD from Harvard Medical School, followed by residency at Harvard as well, and then a fellowship in the laboratory of Dr. Judah Folkman studying angiogenesis. In 1998, he returned to Atlanta, Georgia, where he became a faculty member in the Department of Dermatology and rose up the ranks to the esteemed position as the Thomas Lawley Endowed Professor of Dermatology. As if that weren't enough, he has also created a company called Acutus, which helps bring novel therapies to the clinic. In 2022, he joined my colleagues at Metro Dermatology, where he is now seeing patients and continuing his really exciting research work. I'm super thrilled to have him on today. He definitely gave me some new insights in some old remedies to help maintain our skin barrier, and I'm really excited to share that with you all today. All right, let's get started. Dr. Arbizer, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Let's just start with telling our listeners, what is the skin barrier? I know some people may have heard of it. I'm definitely hearing it more in popular magazines and social media. But as a dermatologist, can you tell the listeners what the skin barrier is? As we know, the skin is the largest organ of the body, and basically it exists to keep noxious things out. So it keeps bacteria out, bad chemicals, and it helps fight bacteria. Think of leather or fur. Think of the lasting properties those have. Those are, leather and fur are dead, but the skin is a living barrier that keeps bacteria and and noxious and fungus and, and other noxious things out and actually responds to insults. So as opposed to fur or leather, which cannot respond to an insult, the living skin barrier is actually makes you appreciate the creativity of God that it picks up insults and responds to them appropriately. And when the barrier is disrupted, the body thinks it's constantly being attacked and leads to chronic inflammation. That underlies most of our common inflammatory diseases such as psoriasis, atopic dermatitis or eczema, and a lot of the problems we see in aging skin. And so basically, just like you have to take care of leather And fur, you also have to take care of the living barrier. I'm going to talk about some of our discoveries that allow us to take better care of it. And if you can maintain the skin barrier and keep it healthy, you can decrease the amount of inflammation and also slow down skin aging. You know, when you have surgery or you cut your skin and you traumatically injure the skin, that is also damaging the skin barrier. But what 
we are talking about more today are these sort of chronic conditions that can affect the skin barrier over time rather than sort of an acute injury or cut where the skin is opened up. Right. Now, I know when even, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, when I was younger, struggling with acne, my whole goal was to dry my face out, dry the oil out. And I thought if I could just remove everything on top of my skin, I would cure my acne which of course did not work and really actually worsened it. So it's great to hear that people and researchers are delving into how important the skin barrier is for chronic conditions and common skin conditions that we see. Right. And it's kind of like, I think acne is a really good example because, you know, we think that oil causes acne and it's not necessarily oil per se that causes acne. It's kind of a response to bacteria and, and hair follicles that underlie acne. And as, as you've shown from your own experience, that drying out the skin doesn't necessarily help in terms of treatment. That theory, it, it's so pervasive. I, I still come across it so often. Even people who work in my office, some of the things they put on their skin to dry it out or, or remove that oil. So it's definitely something that we need to educate our patients and our listeners about that we need to do more than just stripping the skin of all the natural oils to help these more chronic conditions. Right. Totally agree. We know there are some conditions where the skin barrier is dysregulated, you could say. Can you talk a little bit more about that, like perhaps psoriasis or eczema? So when you think of a newborn baby, most newborn babies have really nice skin. And as we get older, we tend to see more eczema or atopic dermatitis in children. And then psoriasis tends to be more of an issue in adults. And then when you think of the elderly, you think of you know, actinic keratosis and seborrheic dermatitis, also which involve impairment of the barrier function. So basically, the impaired barrier is, is you know, we're born with, most of us are born with really nice skin. And changes happen during the aging process. And there are some rare genetic conditions where you have um, impaired barrier at birth, and it's quite obvious when, when you see that. You know, there tend to be autosomal sets of conditions, which are fortunately quite rare. But as we get older, you know, we see these changes. And since we're not born with eczema or psoriasis, that leaves the hope that if we can understand what caused the change to, to cause these disorders, maybe we can reverse them. And so the fact that, that we're born with, with nice skin in general means that there's the hope of, of being able to reverse it. Right, that it's not something innate that you're necessarily born with or programmed into your DNA, although you do make a good point that certainly as dermatologists, we do see these conditions where there are genetic abnormalities within the DNA and proteins and structures of the skin. But again, fortunately, those are rare and not really what we're delving into today. So let's talk about just someone with quote unquote normal skin who maybe doesn't have eczema or psoriasis, but maybe they're now in their 40s or their 50s and they're noticing their skin changing. I do see a lot of people putting on lots of products, being sold or marketed to use lots of different creams and I call them potions. And I, I really believe that this is harming their skin barrier and they're almost doing too much. But what do you recommend for just sort of the average person to protect their skin barrier in general? When people ask me, what do I recommend for putting on your face for people in their 40s and older? I say plain water. If you're talking about people in their 80s, I might add some Vaseline or petroleum jelly. But for people our age and, you know, people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, the less you put on your face, the better. Because a lot of these things have detergent functions and a lot of them are pro-inflammatory. And just because a lot of things we put on are not prescription doesn't mean they don't really have effects on the skin. I like just plain water and keep it simple. And I think it's really good. Because a lot of these products are really expensive. And I tell the patients, you know, it's, they say, is this good for me? And I said, it's really good for the people who are manufacturing this stuff. It's not really good for you. It's so hard, though, for people to hear that because we want so badly to have a cream or lotion or, or some serum we can put on that can just magically turn our skin beautiful. 
So I totally get what you're saying. As you get older, your skin in general gets drier. And to your point, using less is more. What about someone who's in their 20s or 30s? Do they need to be as careful or are there other things they should be doing to protect their skin barrier? Basically, minimizing sun exposure, I think, is the most important thing. Trying to take aggressive control of acne and you know, trying to prevent the scarring. In my lecture, I say there's three things that really are important for the skin barrier, and it's based on the research we've done, and it's very relevant to aging. It's kind of like acid, ceramides, and mitochondria. I think of them as forming a triangle, which are interrelated. The normal pH of the skin is acidic. It's less than 7. And a dermatologist in the 1920s, Alfred Marcionini, um, discovered what he called the acid mantle of the skin. And basically, you have to keep the pH somewhat acidic, and that actually repels pathogenic bacteria. As we get older, it's harder to maintain an acid pH because you need um, mitochondria. And as we age, our mitochondria get less and less efficient, and you need energy to pump out the acid and keep the, the acid pH below 7. And then finally, I'm talking about ceramides, and ceramides are these waxy substances that are part of the skin barrier and they repel water, but they're also an early detection system for infection and skin breaks. And the thing that makes ceramides a little bit confusing is, and I can simplify it, is that ceramides can be metabolized into something called singacine 1-phosphate, which is pro-inflammatory. And so you'll see a lot of products that say contain ceramides, and if you put ceramides on inflamed skin, it gets converted into sphingosine 1-phosphate, and uh, it doesn't really help. Does it make it worse? Is it sort of adding fuel to the fire? It could make it worse. The reason that I got interested in this, uh, just kind of the story behind it, is that we were studying compound from ant venom that had anti-inflammatory properties. And the structure of the compound from ant venom, solenopsin, looked like ceramide, but it was in a form that could not be converted into the pro-inflammatory sphingosine 1-phosphate. So it did all the things that ceramides did but couldn't be converted into the pro-inflammatory sphingosine 1-phosphate. And so you need the ceramides to uh, keep the skin sealed, but you don't want them to be converted into this pro-inflammatory bad sphingosine 1-phosphate. And so putting in ceramides onto inflamed skin without doing other things might be adding fuel to the fire. I think of this triangle, you know, that's interrelated. You've got to keep the skin acid. You've got to keep the mitochondria healthy. And if you do that, the ceramides are going to do their job and not get converted into sphingosine 1-phosphate. Certainly, you, it's hard to find a product that doesn't contain ceramides. So you're not necessarily saying ceramides we should avoid, but just perhaps not to put it on inflamed skin without some other treatments. That's correct. I think we both realize the body is really amazing at keeping this balance, especially if you don't have an underlying skin condition. And your skin sort of knows what to do, keeps it at the right pH. And the cell turnover is typically about every three weeks. And I'm always just amazed at how your skin knows what to do if we just let it do what it is supposed to do. I think sometimes we harm it or we cause dysregulation by by doing too much, by overdoing it with the exfoliation or using harsh drying soaps and not applying a moisturizer afterwards to kind of seal in that hydration. And if we just kind of let our skin be, then a lot of times it works itself out. Of course, the caveat being, you know, this is for someone who has quote unquote normal skin and not some underlying chronic pro-inflammatory skin condition. W- you agree? I agree, but but I would also add that even with patients with inflammatory skin conditions, if you can acidify things, you can sometimes make them better. I'll give you a couple of examples that we published. We recently, so psoriasis of the palms and soles is a very difficult condition to treat and often requires biologics, you know, and, and you're talking about a $20,000 a month expense. And one of the things that we found is, is that if you take trichloroacetic acid, the medium strength chemical peel, and put it on the hands and feet on monthly intervals, you can sometimes get long-term remission of these tough inflammatory conditions. And you think that putting acid on inflamed skin would hurt, and it actually doesn't. 
and I tried it on myself. So um, then I, they gave me the confidence to try it on other patients, and it doesn't hurt, and it actually sometimes uh, is quite helpful and, and allows me to avoid using biologics. What strength TCA are you using? 40 to 50 percent. So a, a pretty good medium dose strength. And are you doing two passes and, and going really kind of rubbing them or just lightly applying? I'm rubbing them. You, you want to get into the fissures and cracks. And I know that sounds really counterintuitive because you're putting acid on inflamed skin. But what's really quite interesting is that inflamed skin is already alkaline. So you're actually bringing it back to its normal pH. You do this for palmer plantar, like hands and feet, or, re- or is this regular psoriatic plaques? I do it on all psoriasis, but I find it particularly effective on hands and feet, which, which, as you know, is some of the most difficult. And I find it to be particularly effective on, on the hands and feet. And the other, other kind of clinical curl that I'd like to share is that for inflammatory diseases like severe dermatitis, I use cider vinegar, you know, which is also acidic. And I like the cider part because the cider has natural anti-inflammatory properties. How do you recommend patients use that? I tell them to use it on undiluted cider vinegar on a Q-tip or a cotton ball, you know, and rub the inflamed areas. You can put it into the scalp. You can put it around the ears, behind the ears, in the T-zone. It's a cheap way of acidifying the skin that you can do at home. And I find it as effective as a lot of prescriptions. You know, especially in this day and age, people want natural, they want organic. You can't get more organic than plain white vinegar. I haven't specifically tried it. It probably would be beneficial. I just like the the cider part because there's natural antioxidants that are developed by fermentation. You know, I think of cider vinegar as as a a way of delivering them. And it's interesting. It has pretty quick anti-itch properties. You know, when you put acid, whether it's TCA or vinegar on itchy lesions, they oftentimes you get a very quick relief of the itch. And so basically it's kind of if you, you know, the itch receptors seem to be activated at uh, high pHs. And if you reduce the pH, you uh, can really very quickly reduce itch. This is great. Well, do you have any other pearls for us on simple kind of home remedies for protecting the skin barrier? So one of the things that I find useful for, in particular for atopic dermatitis is gentian violet, which is a medication that's been used for over 100 years, and it's non-prescription. You can get it on Amazon. Some pharmacies do carry it, and it's very effective in killing gram-positive bacteria. You know, the pathologic gram-positive bacteria like, like alkaline skin, and gentian violet just kills everything that's gram-positive you know, pretty instantly and also helps reduce itch. The downside is it is it's messy and can stain clothes, but there's something called grandma stain remover that can get rid of it if it stains clothing, but it's very inexpensive and it helps reduce itch. And especially with atopic dermatitis where you have colonization of staph and strep, it, it immediately decolonizes it. And I prefer it over bleach bath. And the reason that bleach bath, in my opinion, don't work as well as, as originally thought is because bleach baths are alkaline. I mean, to make bleach, you, you mix chlorine with lye, which is very alkaline, um, and that gives you sodium hypochlorite. And so bleach baths are very good at killing bacteria, but they're alkaline. And so that kind of decreases their efficiency, and they are actually kind of drying. I tend not to use bleach baths, um, and I would use gentian violet over bleach baths to get rid of bacteria. For our listeners, bleach baths are Think of putting your skin or submerging yourself in a mild swimming pool. That's essentially what a bleach bath is. You put a little Clorox or bleach into your bathtub or your sink. It's very mild. It doesn't sting. It doesn't burn. And it does just help remove bacteria that's living on the skin that can worsen some of these inflammatory conditions. I'm curious to know how you tell your patients to use a gentian violet do you recommend a, a bath? Do you recommend just sort of warm compress with gentian violet on it? What, how do you counsel your patients to use it? So I would apply it just to the affected areas on the Q-tip and let it sit. And sometimes if it's very inflamed, put some Vaseline on top of it and then cover it up. And that's really effective in getting rid of itch. You know, it, it's kind of most people don't want their entire bodies covered with it. But, but for lesional skin, it's quite well tolerated. Kids like it. 
and so it's it's very acceptable for kids. People don't like it on the face. I don't use it there, but for areas that are covered, I find it quite useful. It's great to see that we can actually use these very simple, low cost products to help our skin. And it it kind of goes against the thought that every condition needs these expensive tens of thousands of dollar special formulations. Right. You spend a lot of your time, and and so do I, and and office staff on getting pre-authorizations for very expensive medications that don't necessarily cure the disease. One of the problems I have with biologics is they're very effective for a lot of conditions, but we don't know when to stop them. And so you, let's say you have 100 patients who are getting a biologic for psoriasis, you know, a certain number you could take them off and the psoriasis would not come back for a long time. And there's a certain number where the, where the psoriasis would come back very quickly. And we don't know who those patients are. We're treating a large number of patients probably unnecessarily with very expensive and immunosuppressive therapies. In this day of COVID, with supply chain disruptions, I mean, we recently had problems with with baby formula, which is a lot easier to make than a biologic. I'm concerned about a time when, you know, we might not have some of these biologics available. And, you know, we've got to be prepared to treat our patients with simple stuff if we've got a supply chain disruption. Right. And and not even that, just being cognizant of the ever rising cost of medical care and treatment that just because something is more expensive doesn't mean it's better. And these are all, at least at this point in time, chronic conditions of the skin that we cannot cure yet. Perhaps there will be a, a time, hopefully in our practice generation, but um, you know, there's there isn't a cure at this point. So really being able to manage these with simple but effective solutions is really key. Another thing that I love to do when I would treat psoriasis and eczema is really just hydration using a thick petrolatum-based product and sealing in moisture. I, I still vividly remember seeing a, a picture in residency of someone who had very severe psoriasis, and the only treatment they used was Vaseline, and it really improved their psoriatic plaques. And that was a great teaching point for me to to realize, hey, sometimes simple things like hydration, locking in the moisture can be just as effective as a steroid or biologic. That's really true. And it reminds me of a study we did some years ago where we showed that barrier disruption increases the production of vascular endothelial growth factor, which is an angiogenic factor that's found in psoriasis. And basically, the reason that psoriasis is red is because you have dilated and leaky blood vessels. And just by restoring the barrier with hydration, you can decrease the production of the vascular endothelial growth factor and have a dramatic impact on patient inflammatory skin disease. Very cool. Well, I am so excited that there are smart dermatologists and physician scientists like you out there doing this important work and, and delving into the research behind all this. And I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing these simple but highly effective strategies for protecting our skin barrier. Thank you. And I'm grateful that there's smart clinical dermatologists like yourself who are serving our patients. It's a lot of fun. Well, listen, where can my listeners follow you or find you if they want more information about the skin barrier and just the work that you're doing? I can be reached by email at rbeezer at hotmail.com. And I have a Twitter account, rbeezermd. Those are probably the best ways to reach me. Well, I really appreciate you being here and I will see all my listeners next week. Thank you very much and keep up the good work. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to The Skin Reel. I hope it's been informative, educational, and perhaps a little entertaining. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to like and subscribe and share with a friend. Don't want to stop your learning just yet? Head on over to theskinreel.com for show notes, blog post, and so much more. Until next time, skin friends.